Good morning and welcome to Business Law. My name is Mirka Kaingunga and I'll be your tutor for the subject of Business Law. My contact details, as you can see, are on the first slide with my email address. Please feel free to contact me should you have any questions at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Business Law. The law. The law is defined as an objective set of rules that govern conduct. The law governs legal subjects which are either natural persons such as you and I and juristic persons such as a close corporation and companies. It is very important for a country to have certain laws in place because laws also, um, laws are there in place to make sure that we live in peace and harmony. The legal subjects are the bearers of subjective rights held over legal objects. Legal objects are objects over which legal subjects exercise control. Subjective rights. You have different types of subjective rights. You have the real rights, which is the right of ownership and possession, which is, the, like for example, the purchase of a vehicle or a house. That is what we call a real right. It is your real right to purchase a house or a vehicle. Then there are also personal rights. The right to claim performance, which is the right of a creditor to demand money from a, from a debtor for money lent. It is a personal right. Personality rights. It's a right to protect one's personality, the right to do, to do good, and the right to a good name and dignity. That is personal rights, which is a very important right as well, that you actually exercise without you. With, uh, these are the type of rights that we actually exercise without us even knowing that, you know, we are actually exercising a right. Intellectual property rights. These are rights that protect immaterial property, such as copyright, trademark, and patent. These are called subjective rights. There are two main categories of laws. We have the public law as well as the private law. But for now, we're just going to look at the public law. Public usually just refers to the general public, like what the word says, and then private refers to the private um, law. It refers to the private part of society as um, the word itself defines it or the word itself says it, that it's a private law. Public law. Public, public law refers to public international regulates or international, public international regulates the relationships between different states. Regulates the power of the state including human rights law. An administrative law that regulates the executive authority of the state. The private law. The law of persons regulates the legal status of persons. Family law protects family relationships and consists of rules relating to marriage and divorce. The law of things of property law regulates the relationships between legal subjects and movable and immovable property. So in private law, it ref you can look at it more as towards the private life the law of persons, the law, the, the family law that also protects, because remember laws are there in order to protect us and the law of things or property, you know, the laws over the things that we possess, our assets. The constitution through the Bill of Rights gives us human rights. So it's also important to know that each and every country, like for example in Namibia, the Namibian constitution through the Bill of Rights gives us as Namibians human rights. We have the right to life, the right to human dignity, the right to freedom and expression, the political right, the right to freedom move or freedom movement and residence, the right to housing, the right to health care, food and water, and the right to education, the right to access for information. So these are all the rights that we as Namibians, us as individuals also have within Namibia. 
So we have the right to life, we have the right to housing, you know, the right to health care. You know, you have the right to health care, meaning that nobody can come and say, you know what, you are not allowed to go see a doctor. Under no circumstances are you allowed to see the doctor. You can actually stand up and tell this person that, you know what, I have the right to health care, hence I have the right to life and I have the right to do that which I would like to do. The law of a contract. A contract is a valid agreement between two or more persons, natural or juristic, juristic, which complies with certain requirements and which the law recognizes and attaches rights and obligations to. So then what this is just telling us is that the law of a contract, usually when a contract is signed, a contract is signed between two or more people. You can never have a contract that's just signed by one person, unless it's a contract, you know, a contract on your own, a contract that you make um, on your own, but it's really not really worth really calling it a contract then, because a contract is between two people, two individuals, two companies, or two organizations. And whenever these two come together, they comply to certain requirements that the law recognizes, recognizes and attaches rights and obligations to. What makes a contract valid? What makes a contract valid are five points, right? Which I have termed CCLPF. So it's double C L P F. Double C refers to consensus. The other C refers to capability. So CC refers to consensus and capability. L refers to legality. P, possibility. And F, formality. That is what makes a contract valid. Because when, you, when, when, when you've drawn up a contract, you should have come to some sort of consensus about what it is that you are agreeing to, the capabilities which goes with it, the legality that goes with it, the possibilities, and as well as the formalities, the necessary formalities also need to take place when agreeing and signing a contract. By consensus, this is what I am referring to, consensus is an agreement which is constituted by a valid offer and a valid acceptance. It is established between an offerer, which is the one who makes an offer, and an offeree, the one who accepts the offer. It determines the terms and conditions in the contracts, the date, the time, and place of concluding the contract. The factors affecting a consensus are misinterpretation, mistakes, duress, which is now force, and undue influence. Those are the factors that affect consensus. Capacity to contract. This refers to the capacity to contract. Not all legal subjects have capacity to enter into contracts such as minors. Minors older than seven years but younger than 18 have limited contractual capacity meaning that you cannot enter into a contract with a one-year-old because a one-year-old can barely read or write or make decisions on their own. That is capacity to contract. Legality. Contracts must, this refers to contracts, must be legally possible, meaning that it needs to be legal. You cannot enter into a contract which is illegal. For example, Whatever it is that you're agreeing on must match the laws that are in place, the laws that have been set um, in place by our constitution. Possibility is the performance in terms of the contract should be objectively and subjectively possible. The work must be capable of being paid and the workers be capable of being paid. That is possibility. Formality. A contract needs to be written or registered. For example, the sale of a property needs to be in terms of a written agreement and registered at the deeds office before payment. 
it is very important whenever you sign a contract make sure that all the formalities have been followed through the formalities are in, in place to protect you as the individual entering into the contract and also to prevent the one that is entering into the contract with you forms breach of contracts you can read more about that on page 35 to 37 however we have our first question which is question one which says match the form column to a description in the table on the next slide so i'm going to go over to the next slide the form is mora debitoris the second one is mora creditoris and three repudiation repudiation so then all that you just need to do is that you have to match the form to the description we start off with mora debitoris mora debitoris is when the debtor does not perform at the agreed time of his um, delayed performance by looking by that uh, definition already we can see that the form um, matches description c mora creditoris that's when the creditor fails to give cooperation when the debtor is willing and able to perform or has already performed hence the answer to to number two is a repudiation repudiation is express refusal by either party to perform all or some of the obligations under a contract before they become due. So that is the answer to three, which is repudiation, matches the description in B. It is very important that you also understand these terms and terminologies because as you enter into contracts, um, you might come across a situation where there's a breach of contract and you will be able to refer to them as, you know, mora debitoris, mora creditoris, and repudiation. It all sounds really like big words, and yes, they are big words, but however, it is important for you to know these. It is very important that you know them. Lease contracts. Um, in your book, you've covered, in the textbook, we've covered many different types of leases, but specifically in this session, I'm going to cover the lease contract. Now, the lease contract involves a lease agreement. It's a contract between a landlord, which is the lesser, and a tenant, which is the lessee, in which the tenant is allowed to enjoy the property in exchange for payment for rent. So a lease agreement, it takes place between the landlord and a tenant. So meaning that this tenant will be living in the landlord's property or doing something within the landlord's property. It's essential to note the following in a lease agreement. The number one, the property to be let. Number two, the rental period, meaning the time frame. The rent paid in money or fruits. By fruits, it refers to, by fruits you can read more in your textbooks so that you can understand exactly what is meant by that. And, but it's in this case, we are referring to property that is being leased out. And we say that um, it needs to, you know, the money is also a very important um, factor. And then number four, temporary use and enjoyment by the tenant. What exactly is it that the tenant is allowed to enjoy? Since it's only temporary, since it's a lease agreement, it has an end. There are different duties of a landlord and also of a tenant. So we're going to cover the duties of the landlords now. The duty, one of the duties of a landlord is to deliver occupation of the lease property to the tenant in a condition that will enable the tenant to use it as per lease agreement. So meaning that that which is written in the lease agreement should be that which the tenant can enjoy on the leased property. Place and maintain the property in a proper state condition and state of repair. So meaning that before the landlord even gives his property over to the tenant, um, it should be ensured that everything that is in the lease agreement is in place and that the place is in proper shape and also that should there be any maintenance on the property that the landlord is fully aware of it and is able to follow it out, you know, repair it. 
repair and maintain and the landlord um, should also repair and maintain the premises. The landlord should ensure that the tenant has undisturbed use and enjoyment of the property, meaning that the landlord has to also respect the tenant when the tenant has already moved in on to that specific um, property. The duties of a tenant. A tenant needs to pay rent on time and place as stipulated in the lease agreement. So what this means is that the tenant has the responsibility that they pay up at the time agreed upon as per lease agreement. The tenant has to use the property in a proper manner as per lease agreement. For example, if the tenant is renting a house, then the tenant cannot now turn the house into a business because it is just not right. The tenant um, got onto this property by lease agreement that, you know, if they're going to be living in this specific house and not selling goods out of the specific house. Another duty is that on termination of the lease agreement, the tenant must vacate the property and return it in a way that it was when it was given to him or her. So meaning that on termination, the tenant needs to make sure that the keys are handed back to the landlord meaning that the tenant cannot still live within the property or bring in other people without the consensus or without the, um, without the go-ahead by the landlord. So it is very important for a tenant to also live up to its duties and its responsibilities. There are also what we call third parties in contracts. Sometimes third parties are, are linked to lease agreements. This is known as a sublease. An example of a sublease is as follows. A tenant has the, cons the consent of the landlord to lease a part or a whole of the lease property. It is different from the lease agreement between the tenant and the landlord. But this can only be done should the tenant have the consent of the landlord. It is then illegal for a tenant to sign another agreement with someone else, allowing them to have access to the property without the consent of the landlord. Termination of lease. Whenever a lease is being terminated, it's important to note that a mutual agreement between the parties is involved. So the two parties, which is the tenant and the landlord, have to come to a mutual agreement that yes, this we have now reached termination. Time expiry. The lease concluded for a fixed term. So that is, we know whenever the, the lease has come to the end of its fixed term, then it is terminated. Notice given as per contract. So meaning that at the termination of the contract, a notice must be given, for example, a one month uh, prior to moving notice. Tenant purchases the leased property, okay, then that's when we also terminate the contract because what happens is that then the tenant buys out the property from the landlord, meaning that the property no longer belongs to the landlord, but that it belongs to the tenant. Then that's also when there's a termination of a lease. Um, destruction of property, for example, the property is, dest is um, destroyed by a fire or another natural uh, disaster of any sort, then when, when, when the property has been destructed, then the contract is also um, terminated. Because, I mean, seriously now, how can, a term, uh, how can a tenant still be paying a landlord money for property that has burnt down to ashes? It just doesn't make any sense. So in that case, that is when there is a termination of a lease. Legislation where leased property can't be used due to illegal purpose. For example, if by any means um, the landlord finds out that the property is being used um, instead of it being um, for, let's say the property is being leased out for a business purpose in the sense of buying, uh, selling legal um, goods. And this tenant now in this leased property has turned the whole thing into a drug hub. In that case, it is illegal and you know, that's when the law steps in, everything is terminated, investigation start and people are locked up. Then again, this is where the contract is terminated. 
Question two. Answer the questions relating to the following. John leases a flat from Kevin for $4,700 Namibian dollars per month. John and Kevin agree that John may use the flat for one year. Is this a contract or a lease? That's question 2A. B is John and Kevin agree that John will not be paying rent money but in turn will clean Kevin's yard twice a week. Is this a valid contract? C. After two months, Kevin tells John that he needs to move out since he wants to rent to some foreigners who are willing to pay in US dollars, US dollars 4,700 per month. Is this allowed? Question 2A, is this a contract or a lease? This is a lease as it's an agreement with a definite time frame to it. So meaning that it's an agreement with a one year time frame to it. John and Kevin have now this new agreement now where um, John will not be paying rent money but will in turn will clean Kevin's yard twice a week. Is this a valid contract? This is definitely not a valid contract as this is not a contract as rentals must be paid in money or parts of money and a part in kind. Payment cannot consist of services. So it definitely is not a valid contract. After two months, Kevin tells John that he needs to move out since he wants to rent to some foreigners who are willing to pay US dollars 4,700 per month. Is this allowed? This is a definite no-go. This is not allowed as John is protected by his real right, which states that John is allowed to finish his tenancy uninterrupted despite, the, despite Kevin's new idea of renting to foreigners. Therefore, John can stay in the flat until his lease period is complete. So it is very important that you understand the law and that you apply the law in your life. It is important that you also know the law because if you do not know the law, then any, anybody out there or any individual can come to you and tell you something and you'll just believe and, you know, just act to that which the person is telling you. So with this, we have come to the end of our business law session. I just want to wish you all the best for your exams. And once again, should you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact me. You have my contact details and thank you.